Great, great. So thank you so much, Seth, for your kind introduction. And also I want to thank to the ISCB for the invitation and the opportunity to present uh, this work today, this uh, webinar. So yeah, as uh, Seth was saying, uh, today I'm gonna focus on one of the main projects I was involved during my PhD. It's entitled Integrating and Formatting Biomedical Data as Precalculated Knowledge Graph Embeddings in the Biotech. It was carried out at the Institute of Research of Biomedicine in Barcelona in the Structural Bioinformatics and Network Biology Lab, uh, supervised and led by uh, Professor Patrick Allot. So I would like to start this uh, presentation with a brief introduction that is going to help me to put this project into, into context. And actually, we'll start with something that I guess of most of the audience already know, that is that biological systems are complex. And I like to illustrate this uh, idea with this picture showing how just a single protein by interacting with many other proteins is able to regulate very different yet important biological processes from the metabolism of biomolecules to the fate of the cells. So in order to un try to understand all of this complexity, there have been appearing different fields in biology trying to characterize and describe what is happening inside living beings from the status and modifications of a genome to the expression of the proteins or the manifestation of particular phenotypes. So all of these fields and others have been collecting a lot of data during the last years, populating biomedical databases with a wealth of information and knowledge to the point that we can start considering that biology have entered into a big data era. Indeed, in 2020, there was more than a thousand and a half uh, databases only listed in the NAR collection well, the EMBL was reporting that they were using almost 400 petabytes just to allocate their resources. So, of course, the accumulation of all of this data and knowledge have allowed the scientific community to describe many different events and relationships happening in biology. Not only at the level of genes and proteins, but also between other entities of biomedical relevance, such as cell lines, small molecules or diseases. So given all of this heterogeneity and complexity, uh, it was uh, soon evident the needs of ways to, you know, to model how all of these biological and chemical entities are actually relating to each other. And in this regard, networks proven to be a very intuitive and convenient way to represent such associations. For instance, it is well known that proteins usually need to interact between each other physically in order to perform a given molecular action. And this kind of interactions can be easily modeled and naturally modeled by networks in which the nodes in this case represent the proteins and the edges of the network represent the interactions that these proteins are having. But also networks have been used to represent functional interactions in which two proteins don't necessarily need to interact physically between each other in order to regulate or modulate each other. And these kind of interactions uh, usually occur in coordinated biological processes or biological pathways. Of course, it has been also possible to link heterogeneous entities. For instance, the connection of a particular mutation to the disease that is associated with, or the binding of a small molecule to its protein target. But in order to connect all of these networks and therefore represent all of these associations in a single uh, network, we have to rely on a specific type of architectures such as knowledge graph. In a knowledge graph, the nodes in this case, represent biomedical entities such as genes, compounds, diseases, or pathways. And the edges of this network represent relationships and events that happen between these entities. For instance, a compound may interact with a given gene, but at the same time, uh, may be treating a given disease or causing a given disease. However, if one wants to use networks to model all of these interactions, one has to take into account that networks are not the more computationally efficient um, architectures. And this is mainly due to the fact that most computational algorithms bridge the networks through the adjacency matrix, which is a matrix in which the nodes are represented in the rows and the columns. And then we have a one or a zero telling us whether two nodes are actually interacting or not. So as you can imagine, when this network gets huge due to accumulation of uh, data, uh, this matrix quickly became highly dimensional and sparse, which are precisely two properties that make most of the computational algorithms be extremely inefficient. So aware of that, there has been a subfield in network science that have tried to represent these uh, networks in a more computationally friendly format. This was achieved through a process that is called a network embedding in which it's able to represent these networks in a low dimensional space where the columns 
of these matrices are fixed regardless of the number of nodes and associations that are being incorporated in the network. So basically, after network embedding, each node is represented by a low dimensional numerical vector so that the distances between these vectors can capture both local properties, me meaning the interactions that the nodes were having with its vicinity, but also global properties of interest in the network. So if we really want to make use of all of this biomedical data, we have to rely on computational approaches. And to the same, we first need uh, ways to, you know, to harmonize, integrate, and transform all of this complex data into a format that is more homogeneous and efficient, optimized for computational tasks and applications. And if we manage to do it like that, then we can uh, make use of the computers to properly exploit all of this uh, data that is uh, available. And this basically motivated uh, this project. So the idea here, the objective was to kind of uh, provide a systematic framework to collect, harmonize, and integrate most of this biological and biomedical knowledge so that it can be efficiently and effectively exploited in downstream computational applications. To the same, we started by collecting and, in, and processing uh, data from different uh, data sets of interest. And we decided to integrate all of these data that we pre-process into a knowledge graph. Since, as we have seen, they are quite a convenient way to represent heterogeneous associations. However, as we wanted to exploit all of this uh, knowledge, we decided to transform this uh, data, this information, into a more computationally friendly format through the use of network embedding. So we started embedding this knowledge graph in a systematic way, creating this way a resource of embeddings. That is what we call the biotech resource. And then having the data format in this way, we can either go predictive or descriptive. But first things first, this is the knowledge graph that we devised. It. it comprises 12 different entities, being the genes or the proteins uh, represented in the middle. Surrounding them, we have cell lines, tissues, diseases, chemical compounds that are organized into chemical entities and pharmacological classes, perturbagens, that is anything that perturbs a gene but is not a chemical compound, namely a microRNA or an antibody. And these four classes here allow us to, you know, to organize a bit the information that we know about genes and proteins. For instance, their biological pathways, the cellular compartments in which the proteins are located, the molecular functions, or the protein domains. All of these entities are connected through 67 different associations. For instance, a compound may interact with a given gene that can be mutated in a given cell line or associated to a given pathway. And after populating this knowledge graph with all the data that we collected from uh, these hundred of data sets, we end up covering almost half a million of nodes and more than 30 million of edges. Obviously, all of this distributed across the different entities and associations that we define it in the knowledge graph. Next, we devised a pipeline to start embedding this information that we gathered into a more computationally friendly format. And for that, what the main strategy that we uh, followed was to to get this data and encode this data in, in pieces, meaning that we first decide which kind of associations and information we were interested in from the knowledge graph, we extracted this information and when we created an embedding space to represent that. And for that, we made use of something that is called a metapath, that is just a recipe that tells us how to traverse this knowledge graph through specific entities and associations. So imagine that we want to connect the compounds and the diseases according to the genes that are shared in common. What we can do is to define a metapath that tells us from the compound entity, you have to go to the gene entity through an edge that is called interacts. And then from the gene, you go to a disease entity through an edge that is called associates. So by following this metapath, we end up connecting all the compounds with all the diseases according to the genes that are shared in common, creating an in-network in which compounds and diseases are connected and weighted according to the path that we found. And from this network, we can implement a network embedding approach to transform all of these connections into a low dimensional representation in which each compound and its disease is represented by a, a numerical vector of 128 dimensions. So the idea here is that drugs and diseases whose vectors are similar and therefore are close in the embedding space will be those that were sharing more connections according to the meta path that we define. And then we can exploit the distances between these vectors to, on the one hand, validate and assess the quality of the embedding space, but on the other, also characterize which other type of information has been captured and encoded in this uh, dimensional space. 
And by the way, we use this uh, pipeline to explore about 800 unique metapaths that are 800 unique biomedical contexts and scenarios that can be explored from this uh, knowledge graph. And given the fact that we can use different data sets to represent the, tape, the same type of associations, we end up producing more than a thousand of uh, metapath data set descriptors following this pipeline. So for each of the metapaths that we uh, created, we systematically validated and characterized uh, their embedding spaces. And for that, we made use of uh, this kind of analysis. So here I'm showing all the analysis that we produce for the metapath that we have just seen, that is the compound interagene associated diseases. So one of the things that we always do is to project these 128 dimensions in a 2D representation, this is a TSD, so that we can, we can have a broad idea of the structure of the embedding space. In this case, drugs are, are colored in blue and diseases are colored in red. Also, we do some type of analysis in order to assess the quality of the embedding space. And this is basically trying to recapitulate using the distances of these vectors, the original network that we had in the knowledge graph. And we assess uh, this quality based on the R under the rock curve from this uh, recapitulation. And finally, and perhaps more interesting, we also characterize which other type of orthogonal information has been captured in these embedding spaces. This is basically asking whether two nodes that are closed in this space, for instance, two drugs here, are also sharing other uh, biomedical traits of interest. For instance, here we assess whether the drugs were sharing mechanism of action, structure, chemical structure, or pharmacological action. And this is quantified based on the R under the rock curve from an unsupervised prediction using distances of these vectors. Of course, we can also do this between disease, disease pairs and also between the compound and disease pairs. And in this regard, in this example, it was quite interesting to see that this metapath was able to recapitulate to some extent drug treatment associations, meaning that sometimes the compounds that end up close to a given disease in this space were actually the compound that was treating this disease. And this was quite interesting to see, given the fact that we didn't use this information when we devised this metapath. Remember that here we are just connecting compounds and diseases based on the genes that are shared in common. And well, in this um, projection, we just highlighted some clusters in which this drug treatment uh, association was uh, preserved. So by systematically characterizing um, and all of these embedding spaces, we can now easily identify which would be the best metapath to deal with a particular task of interest. So imagine that we want to predict or identify the molecular function of a given protein or the pharmacological class of a given compound. What we can do is to just run all the metapath that we have produced based on how well they recapitulate this information. Of course, if we do that, the first ones that appears are the ones that are encoding the proper information that is gene has molecular uh, function or compound has pharmacological class. But then we can also find other metapath descriptors that are quite good at recapitulating these kind of signals. And therefore, if, if one wants to you know, train a machine learning model, um, I would recommend to use these descriptors, so given the fact that they are quite good at recapitulating these uh, signals. But also we can use this strategy to try to identify the applicability domain of different data sets encoding the same type of information. For instance, here, I'm focusing on protein-protein interactions only, but I am embedded three different data sets. A string that gathers functional interactions, intact that focus on physical interactions, and omnipath that is specialized in signaling interactions. So by embedding each of these data sets individually, and then comparing the profiles of signals, biomedical signals that they are recapitulating, we could easily see that indeed a string is the more versatile of these three, capturing a broad range of different biomedical signals, but being particularly good at identifying proteins in the same pathways. While intact, of course, is quite good with physical interactions, but also with protein complexes. While omnipath is really good at identifying phosphorylation events, that is kinase and phosphatases interactions, but also transcription factor associations. And therefore, by doing this analysis, we can now easily identify these applicability domains for these data sets and then um, have a, a better idea of, depending on the tasks that we are interested in, know which should be the data sets that we should uh, use for our analysis. 
So one of the things after having explored such a variety of, of, of meta paths was, was really to see if we were able to capture different biomedical signals or we were just capturing the same type of interactions, but just with different names. And to explore that, what we did was to represent the same type of entities. In this case, we have four different types. Here we have genes, compounds, diseases, and cell lines. And we represented the same entities in different metapath descriptors. So given the fact that we can map or associate a given metapath to a given biomedical context, then we could explore whether there were differences or similarities that were context dependent. And actually this was the case. For instance, we could identify a pair of genes that share the same molecular function, are located, the proteins are located in the same subcellular location, participate in the same biological process, but are expressed by different tissues. Or cell lines, for instance, that share the same mutational and transcriptomic profile, but they, they start differing at the proteome level and they do so in the drug sensitivity level. So all of this suggests that if we really want to capture these similarities and differences that are context dependent, we really need to explore different um, metapaths in this case, different biomedical contexts. So, so far, what we have done is to gather a lot of uh, data from relevant biomedical resources, and we have integrated this data into a knowledge graph. Then we have devised a strategy to transform this information into a more computationally friendly format that are the network embeddings. And we have assessed that these network embeddings capture uh, meaningful information from the knowledge graph. And also that we really need to explore different contexts in order to capture these similarities and differences that are context dependent. So having produced this resource of embeddings, then we started exploiting all of this uh, data. And in particular, we exploited this data in predictive tasks, given the fact that uh, these network embeddings have been optimized for machine learning applications. And concretely, one of the uh, tasks that we were particularly interested in was the one of predicting new disease treatments and drug indications. We were interested in this task because it's a quite a challenging task to model. This is mainly due to the fact that, well, while drugs can be traditionally represented by chemical fingerprints and lately by bioactivity signatures, diseases are more tricky to be represented given the fact that they are a more abstract, kind of an abstract entity. And not only that, uh, there are very few indications that have been approved for uh, each disease which makes a uh, very few positive instance to train, uh, to properly train uh, machine learning models to predict and, uh, and find out uh, new treatments. So in order to address all of these limitations, we decided to model this problem as a B-model prediction in which we first identified a descriptor for a disease, a descriptor for a compound. We concatenated both descriptors and then we trained a unique model that given at least a pair of disease and compound tell us whether it's a real treatment or not. So by modeling this problem in this way, we were hoping that the model could learn general patterns between the disease and the drug universe that could be transferred to those more underrepresented uh, disease in the dataset based on the similarities of their descriptors. So concretely, we use drug disease uh, indication pairs provided by the RepoDB. And actually we use the first version to train a model. And then we use this, the new associations that appear in the second version to predict and assess the quality of the model. Regarding the descriptors, we limited this exercise to two different type of descriptors for each entity. One that we call the short ones, because we used a short metapath in which we describe the diseases according to the genes that are associated to them, with them, and the drugs according to the targets. But also we use a long metapath in which we use these gene associations as a similarity principle to be able to connect the diseases to other compounds and the drug targets as a similarity principle to connect the compounds to pharmacological classes. And as a baseline, we use typical and traditional descriptors that have been used uh, in this field. For instance, a one hot encoding for the disease and a chemical fingerprint for a drug and a vector of binary associations of genes for the diseases and the drug targets for the compounds. These ones here would be the, the equivalent raw data that we use to derive the short embeddings. 
So after training these models with these different descriptors and comparing them, what we could observe is that for both exercise predicting new treatments for a given disease or new indication for a given compound, the biotech descriptors here in blue and red were achieving much better performances than any of the baseline that we used. For instance, we could be able to identify a new treatment for half of the diseases that we had in the closest 1% of all the drugs that we predicted. And this was the same in the case of the indications. We were able to identify a new indication for half of all the compounds that we had in the closest 2% of all the diseases that we predicted. This corresponded more or less to the top five, top 10 predictions that the model uh, provided. And not only that, we were also able to identify uh, new treatments and indications for those diseases and compounds that were, for which we only have one indication, suggesting that to some extent, the model was able to generalize uh, to those more underrepresented uh, diseases and compounds. For those diseases and compounds for which we had multiple treatments in available in the new release, we could be able to compute, to properly compute um, area under the rock curves. And in this case, we also observed that our descriptors were achieving much better performance than any of the baselines. And this was particularly the case for uh, the long metapaths. And not only that, our descriptors also managed to get these predictions much faster, given the fact that we are representing these vectors with 128 dimensions, while traditionally these vectors have few hundreds or even thousands of dimensions. And also we verified that we were able to predict uh, for different disease families and therapeutic areas. And indeed, in the closest 1% of the predictions, we were able to find new treatments and indications for all the disease families and all the therapeutic areas that we had in our results, in, our, uh, in, the, in the RepoDB uh, database suggesting that our models were able to generalize all of these predictions to different um, families and areas. So beyond predictive tasks, we also wanted to exploit all of this knowledge that we gather to better characterize uh, biomedical experiments that still are appearing nowadays in, in the field. And to the same, um, what we did was to create an automatic tool that we call, call the BQ supports tool. So basically this tool allows us the user to provide a given set of interactions between entities that are covered in the biotech. This can be protein-protein interactions, drugs and their protein targets, cell lines and their genes that are mutated or disease-disease comorbidities. And then this tool automatically identifies in which first, in which metapath these interactions has been also described. And then it calculates similarities in each of the embedding spaces for each of these interactions. Therefore, identifying in which other biomedical context these interactions are, are also similar. And after proper statistical treatment, this tool can provide the biomedical context supporting each individual observation. Not only that, by in, uh, in aggregating all of these support scores, we can also quantify to some extent the potential novelty of the data set which we think can be of particular interest for those being a screening initiative, that each time they want to produce a new release of, uh, and provide new data, they really need to assess the trade-off of the expenses and the cost of running this screening and the novel uh, findings that they are still identifying. And by the way, we explored this idea in, in the publication where we assessed the novelty of the last protein-protein uh, interactions identified in the last release of the human reference interact. But also one of the things that we can do is to try to identify which are the metapaths, the context that better recapitulate this data set as a whole. And therefore identify which would be the best descriptors to train a machine learning model, for instance, to identify data set specific interactions that may have been missed by the original screening in the first place. So to illustrate all of that, now I'm going to show you the results that this, uh, or the analysis that this tool uh, did for a set of drug and protein uh, interactions coming from the FDA uh, biomarkers, meaning that the genes or proteins that were associated to a given compound were actually biomarkers of sensitivity for that compound, according to the FDA. So one of the 
analysis that this one of the general analysis that this uh, wiki supports uh, tool does is this kind of heat maps in which in the columns we represent all the associations that were provided in this case compounds and genes and in the rows we provide the more relevant biomedical context metapath that are supporting these uh, interactions so the idea here is that the redder the color the more similar is a given drug and protein in a particular uh, embedding space so by doing this analysis, we can easily identify, for instance, biomarkers that are somehow associated to the targets of the drugs or interacts maybe with the targets of the drugs. But also we can identify other type of associations, for instance, biomarkers that are associated to a given disease that is actually treated by a given compound. Of course, we can aggregate all of these support scores for each interaction. And this allows us to have a broad idea of how many of these associations are supported and how many are potentially novel according to the information that we have gathered in our resource. And then we can properly stratify this in order to quantify this uh, support at different uh, levels. Also, this tool computes the expected support based on random permutations of the data. So basically, given this uh, set of associations, this tool automatically permutes this network keeping the degree of the nodes, and then recalculates the support scores for these permutations. And by doing that, we can have an idea of which would be the expected support of this data set if the connections were uh, given uh, by random. And in this case, as you can see, the FDA biomarkers associations are enriched in connections that are uh, more supported in the biomedical um, knowledge that we have nowadays. Of course, we can also find out which are the most supported interactions and which are the most supportive uh, descriptors. But also we can identify, as I was saying, which would be the best uh, metacap descriptors to train machine learning models and predict uh, new uh, data set specific associations. So we do that for metapath that encodes both compounds and genes in the same space, but also for those that only encodes either compounds in this case or genes. Therefore, they identify compounds that are similar, have a similar profile of biomarkers or identify biomarkers that tend to be associated to similar uh, compounds. And this again is calculated as an unsupervised prediction based on distances and quantified by the area under the rock curve of these predictions. So well, having produced this resource and proved to be uh, useful in both predictive and descriptive tasks, we decided to open this uh, resource to the community. And to do so, we created a web resource that you can find here. And actually, this is a screenshot of uh, the main page of this resource. This is the explore page, which is intended to allow the user to explore uh, the different metapath descriptors that we have produced. So the idea here is that this knowledge graph here is interactive. So the user can decide uh, which kind of metapath wants to explore by clicking this, this graph. So imagine that we want descriptors for, for compounds. So the user can start by clicking to this compound node. And then this knowledge graph suggests how to continue the path. So which other connections are available from this node. Then let's say that we want to describe the compounds according to genes, associations. We can click to genes. And then this automatically is detected as an existing uh, descriptor in the resource. In this case, it it's showing us the compound interact gene. And here we have a first glance of how the embedding space of this metapath looks like and which kind of information is being captured in, in, in this space. Then the user can decide to change to another data set, change the associations, for instance, maybe explore, can be explored up regulation of a gene or down regulation of a gene, download this descriptor, or just keep growing this metapath and maybe as now link compounds to other entities such as diseases. Of course, we also provide a download page in which all of these descriptors can be uh, downloaded in batches. And there we also provide a couple of Jupyter notebooks illustrating how to programmatically access to this resource. But also we show how to set up uh, machine learning models and how to train them using uh, our descriptors and also how to reproduce most of the analysis that uh, I have been showing you uh, so far. And lately, we have also incorporated the wiki supports to the, to the web page. 
So basically by filling up this form, the user can provide a set of interactions and in a matter of an hour or so, the VQ supports returns to the user um, the analysis that I have just shown, but also some uh, Excel files with all the information that has been computed, meaning the supports scores for each interaction, the novelty levels of the data set, and also the performance of the unsupervised predictions that are being carried out uh, for all of the meta paths that applied. And with that, I think that I have reached the most important slide. Of course, uh, I haven't been alone uh, for in this project. I want to especially thank to my whole group, but especially to Patrick Aloy and Michael Duran Frigola, who has been co-supervising me in this project, but also Martino Bertoni and Martina Locatelli, who has uh, helping me setting up this web resource so that we can uh, make accessible all the descriptors that we created, the funding, and of course, all of you for listening. And now I will be happy to take uh, questions. Excellent. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, so we do actually already have some uh, questions for you in the Q&A. Um, the first takes us back to your background when you were um, showing the different biomedical uh, data types that you had uh, uh, accrued. Um, question is, how well does the data model uh, used in these graphs align with other biological data models like BioLink? Can you repeat? So how well you refer to this one? Uh, was this one might have been the next it was in this general area yeah i'm not sure exactly um when the question was posted but it was it was the graphs in your in your introduction generally um it's how well this one uh i there are a lot more graphs than i remember sorry um i'm gonna put this back to um the community here make sure and ask make sure i'm getting it uh slide 19 is what they've said 19. Thank you for the flip. OK, yes, great. This one, yes. So yeah. And the question uh, so was how this works. How well does the data model used in these graphs align with other biological data models, such as BioLink? So it's a good question. I mean, here, uh, of course, we are representing the, um, the association. So we are representing all of these biological data as terms of associations. So they are data that is uh, naturally represented by binary associations and interactions, such networks. So this is quite uh, really good recapitulated by these kind of uh, interactions. But other types of data, such continuous data, etc., has to be transformed and integ um, integrated in, in this format. And this can help integrating different resources and different type of data, but also can uh, make uh, can make to lose a bit of uh, information. So I don't know uh, exactly the, the the other tool or, or model that you were mentioned, but uh, yes, at the end, with as any model, you have uh, some limitations, but also some advantages. Yeah, makes sense. Right. Um, our next question. Um... Could embeddings computed from various metapaths be combined in some way, uh, or could several metapaths be combined before computing the embedding? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, both. So it can be combined. So it actually it can be combined at um, a posteriori. So you can describe a, the same entity from different uh, perspectives, different metapaths, and like describing a compound according to the targets, according to the treatment of the disease according to the causes, this produced you a different descriptors for the same compound. And then you can concatenate these descriptors and train a model uh, that take use of all of, of most of this information at the same time. Also, in some cases, we have combined different meta paths. So not at the level of the embeddings, but combining different meta paths. For instance, we have aggregated up and down regulations for the cell lines so that we can represent the cell lines a similar gene expression profiles and not just looking at one end or the other. So there are different strategies actually to do that. And one of the advantages of representing this data in a low dimensional space is that you could even concatenate these to other type of descriptors, even beyond the ones that we have produced. For instance, encode a protein according to the sequence using a natural language processing that produces you a descriptor of the protein according to the sequence. 
and then concatenate their uh, other descriptors that are more based on associations, such as disease associations or compound associations. And then train a model later on to exploit uh, all of this uh, information in a more holistic uh, way. Uh, so just a, a follow up for me on this one. Um, and I apologize if it's a naive question. Um, if you if you do take the the um, the descriptors you said and, and say this is a, a text found protein that you then take the descriptor of, would you need some other kind of of either filtering or normalization, something to make sure you're not introducing noise to your uh, to your model? Yes, I would say that this is uh, I would say that this is task dependent. So okay. uh, I, these descriptors as as they are, tend to be quite compact, they are quite good at capturing uh, relevant information and, and leaving out uh, noise. Um, but it, could, it, it, it is true that depending on how you they obtain other descriptors, uh, they, they can be more noisy, but also the different dimensions that they need to represent uh, these entities can also create problems of um, unbalance uh, given their gotcha. representation. So, Natural language processing can represent uh, genes with 500,000 dimensions, while here we are representing uh, hundreds. So there are ways to tackle that. Like you can always do a PCA and to try to uh, reduce a bit of um, noise there, uh, or you can just address this separately. So just train different models using different information at each time, and then do a meta predictor afterwards, etc. But I would say that this is more uh, task dependent. And, and, but yeah, it's uh, something that you have to always take into account when aggregating different descriptors coming from different methodologies. Gotcha. Right. Thank you for explaining. Um, so our next question, um, do all disease versus compound predictions have the same level of confidence? Uh, if not, is there some kind of filtering done? Yes, that's a really good question. So here, of course, so here we didn't play with uh, confidence levels, although it is true that um, there are some indications and treatments that are easier to, to predict than others. And this is just mainly because um, the amount of data we have for them, but also because some, some of the descriptors that we use better align with some type of treatments than others. So short answer is no, we didn't uh, use confidence, although I think it's uh, worth exploring uh, later on. In here, in, in, in this exercise, we didn't want to, to make the, the best um, drug treatment prediction in this case, but we all we wanted to, to emphasize the advantages of uh, encoding and, and having a lot of descriptors to choose and format it in a, in a convenient way to, to have a better um, advantages towards traditional um, descriptors. But yes, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. OK. Um, so our next question, uh, do popular nodes in the KG um, drive the similarities? For example, high degree nodes are more similar to every node in the, or, sorry, are high degree nodes <clears throat> more similar to every uh, node in the KG? Yes, this is a really, really good question. So actually we have to do a lot of work uh, relating, related to that. So I think I have, I have, I think I have a, oops, a slide, yes. So we have to apply a lot of filtering and corrections and normalizations uh, regarding the degrees because it's it's true that uh, there is uh, this high degree that biases uh, the embedding space and this is driven by this knowledge uh, bias. So we implement two things to control for that. One is this WGPC that was developed by Himmelstein and colleagues, uh, the authors of the Etionet knowledge graph, that basically uh, don't wait those uh, connections that are driven by high degree nodes. So basically this helps to reduce the, um, the, this bias, but also we perform some pruning when calculating this metapass so that we don't allow a given node to be connected to a lot of nodes and we just keep the most important connections. And these two steps were uh, pretty relevant. Actually, if we doesn't use any of these corrections at the level of recapitulation of the network, it's quite worse, but also you can easily see that um, as you were saying, um, nodes that have higher degree tend to be on average more close to any other node in the, in, in, the, in the space. So yeah, we implemented this 
but also we play it at the level of distances. So for instance, this is terms, it, this, it happens that uh, there are different um, levels of granularity when defining a disease. You can have a brain disease that is very general, and then you have a migraine, for instance, that is a very specific type of disease. So of course, you would expect that brain disease is more connected to, for instance, a lot of other genes because it's a more general term than migraine. And this is actually what, what happens when you compute the similarities of, in this case, migraine to other nodes and, this, and brain disease to other nodes. So this difference is more clear in Euclidean than in cosine distances. And depending on the exercise, uh, depending on the type of things that we're interested to capture, we rely, for instance, on cosine distance, or we also adapted uh, some statistical uh, modifications of these uh, distances in order to, you know, to normalize these kind of uh, associations. So yeah, it's a problem, and we and this was one of the main things we have to uh, deal with, and we managed to do so in, in in different levels. Seems like a very thorough approach to to deal with it. Um... So one more question. Um, can the original biotech KG, uh, not the embeddings, be downloaded or yes. recomputed? Yes, great question also. Um, yes, so the thing is that what we provide, so in the web page, we provide a, a link to a, a GitHub where we provide all the pre-processing scripts that we use to create the knowledge graph. So we are not providing the networks, the original data sets pre-processed, pre because we wanted to comply with all the licenses that exist between these uh, data sets. And also because we didn't want it to take, um, you know, uh, to take advantage of having this data and reduce the, the downloads from the original sources. So in order to comply with all of this, what we decided to do is not provide the data directly, but provide the scripts that, that to reproduce this data. And most of them have like uh, downloads a script that automatically downloads the data and preprocess this data. What we do provide is the networks for the long metapath. Since in this case, we transform in this network, we create new connections. So when you download the metapath embedding, we also provide the network that we created using the metapath. But the raw original sources that belongs to existing uh, databases, um, we provide the scripts, but not the original data. 